You having fun so far? Well, I'm glad, and it's going to get better, trust me. Well, it might not, but we'll pretend it's going to. So today, I'm doing a little message today called Better to Bless. Fin finish this expression for me. It is better to give than... Who said that? Anybody know who said that? Anybody? Nobody wants to take a stab at it? You know, Jesus would have been a pretty good guess, but in fact, it's not in the Gospels. It's actually in Acts chapter 20, and Paul said it about Jesus. He said, it's like our Lord said, it's better to give than to receive. And then you go read the Gospels, it's not in the Gospels, fun fact. But if Paul said it, and he was a theologian, and he was a man of the word, I believe that Jesus must have said that. Now, if a worship leader had said it, I wouldn't believe it. They just make stuff up as they go along, right? You know what the Bible says, you know, the Lord helps them that help themselves, and an apple a day keeps the doctor away, and yeah, let's stick to the music. So today we're talking about it's better to be blessing than to be blessed, and that's what we learn from Scripture and all kinds of things. Now, if there was one thing that I think the church should be indicted for, the North American church in the 21st century, I think it would be this, that we have focused on being blessed instead of being a blessing. I mean, you look at the church today, and what do we dole out? What do we sell? A privilege and prosperity and pleasure instead of sacrifice and sorrow and suffering. I know what you're thinking, well, who wants that? Well, Jesus did. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed that. That was kind of the direction he went with this because it's good to be blessed, but it's better to be a blessing. And so I want to tell you this little story about this sort of a real life encounter with this. So for many years, probably 30 years or more, we did this Christmas banquet. Now we do a comedy night at Christmas. But we did this Christmas banquet and we had a caterer come in and we was all fancy and people dressed up. And for years we used the same caterer. And then someone said, you know, Pastor Mark, there's this new Christian caterer, a Christian caterer, catering for Jesus. And uh, you really need to use them. And he goes to this other church and you want to bless them. I thought, yeah, okay, we'll give him a try. So we met with them, they planned this out, we planned out the, the menu, et cetera, and it all seemed okay. So on the day of the banquet, there we were, and the food came in, and he kept on coming over to my table, I'd never met him before, and he kept on coming over, and he says, Pastor Mark, you, don't, you would not believe how blessed I am. God is just blessing me and blessing me, and he's opened up the windows of heaven, and he's pouring out a blessing. Mommy. Every 10 minutes, he was back telling me how blessed he was. So anyway, this is what happened. Within about 20 minutes, they ran out of food. They were serving it, and there was 30 people short. We had to order in at our Christmas banquet from KFC. And then, and then the dessert came, and, uh, and it was trifle. Who doesn't like trifle, right? We all know what trifle is. So anyway, they bring out these huge bowls, call them vats, of what looked like vanilla pudding to me, and we went through it like it was an army mess hall tent, and slopping it out like this, and I'm thinking, that looks like vanilla pudding to me. So at the end of the night, he's telling me how blessed he is, and how, asking me how things go on, and, and then he asked me if I was going to be giving him a tip on top of this however many thousand dollar bill. And I said, you know what I'm gonna do? I wanna give, give two tips. I wanna give uh, your staff a tip for the stuff they've done and I wanna give you a tip separately. Would that be all right? He'll, he smiled and nodded like this and I said, so, so I'm gonna give you this first check and you gotta promise me that 100% of this will go to your staff because they did a great job of serving. Will you do that? And he says, absolutely. And I said, now are you ready for your tip? And he says, yeah. I said, okay, here's my tip for you. It's better to be a blessing than to be blessed. That's my tip. And you've been here talking about being blessed all night long, and you forgot to bless us by bringing enough food and bringing good enough food. And I sat with a smile on my face because I'm not as mean as you might think I am in real life. And, and, so, and so I said, you know, it's business 101. You've got to put your customer first. And if you'll take care of your customer, if you'll serve your customer, you know what? It'll always come back to you, and you will succeed. A year later, he was out of business. He didn't take my tip, <laughs> apparently. So I have a little story to tell you about this. I think you'll find this funny. So there's this, this couple getting married, and the wife's a little nervous and a little apprehensive, and she has this verse that she just loves, and it's 1 John 4, 18, and it says that there is no fear in love, for perfect love casts out all fear. And so she decides she's going to phone the caterer and tell him she wants that verse on her wedding cake. So she phones him up, tells him she wants 1 John 4, 18. Two days before the wedding, they phoned her back and said, are you sure you want that verse on your cake? She says, I'm absolutely sure. Just do the verse like I asked. So the cake arrives at the reception at the wedding, and instead of 1 John 4.18, it's John 4.18, which says, 
for you have had five husbands, and the one you are with now is not your husband. <laughs> Missed it by that much, right? So it's good to be blessed, but it's better to be a blessing. And so here we are, we're in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. It's the story of the calling of Abram before he became Abraham, the father of, of the faith and the father of Israel. And so here's what it says, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I shall bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, we know what the interpretation of this was. I mean, God was calling Abraham to be the father of the nation of Israel. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who was Israel, and the 12 tribes. And he says, here's what I want to do. I want to bless you. But I want you to be a blessing. And everybody who you bless, they're going to bless you back. And everyone who blesses you, I'm going to bless them. But if they curse you, I'm going to curse them back. And we still see that today with the Jewish people. Like it or not, that's just the way it works. You bless Israel, you get blessed. You curse Israel, you get cursed. But that's the interpretation of it. What is the application for us today? How does it relate to us in the 21st century? Very simple. He is saying, I want you to get out there and be a blessing. I have blessed you, therefore be a blessing, and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. And I want you to see how this works. God blesses us so that we can what? Be a blessing. And when we're blessing others, then they in turn bless us. And now we're more blessed, so we keep blessing others. And then they get blessed. And then they bless us back. And God blesses us more. Do you see how this keeps going around? Blessing, 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 blessing. Do you know what this is? Ah! Anyone know what that is? That's a vicious circle. And this is not a vicious circle. This is a blessed circle. We, we bless others, and they bless us back. And we are here for this purpose. We are here to get out and be a blessing to our world. Now, here's the good news. You don't have to get out of your country anymore. People say, well, I'm, gonna, I'm called the missions. Good, you're in the right place, Fort Gary. The world is coming to us. We don't have to go anywhere. But the thing is, we have to get out of the four walls of the church. We have to get out of our homes. We have to get into the community. We have to make ourselves and avail ourselves to be a blessing to the world. And see, we have developed this thing in this church. We've imported it, and we've, we've infiltrated it into every aspect of our church. And we call it the blessed lifestyle. And we're asking people, we want you to live the blessed lifestyle. And you all know what it is. You all know what it is. Let's just go through it real quick. Let's go through the letters. You ready? The B-L-E-S-S. -S. Ready? Here we go. The B stands for? Begin with prayer. The L stands for? Listen with, with care. The E stands for? Eat together. The S stands for? Serve in love. The S stands for? Share your story. How many of you had to look at the screen to quote that? A bunch of you, I saw you looking at the screen. I'm nailing this. You know what? We don't actually want you to recite it. It's good that you memorize it. We want you to know it. Here's what we really want you to do with it. We want you to do it. We want you to live this thing out. And here's what we discovered about the best lifestyle. Anybody and everybody can do it. It is so accessible. It is so attainable for each one of us. It's the easiest way you will ever discover to lead someone to Christ is to just go through these five simple steps and it happens automatically. You don't have to be an extrovert. You don't have to be outgoing. You don't have to be an evangelist. Anybody can begin in prayer. Anybody can do that. An introvert can pray. An introvert can really listen. They're excellent at it. Any one of us can do any one of these things. And I know what you're all thinking. I know what you're all thinking right now. You're thinking, Pastor Mark, you preached on this last year. You want to know what else I did last year? I went golfing. And you know what? I'm still no good at it. Just because you do something once doesn't mean you get it. Right? And so I'm glad you've memorized it. I'm glad you can recite it. But what we really need you to do is we need you to live it out every single day. What would happen to our world? What would our world look like if we could get out of the four walls of our church and into our communities and be a blessing instead of seeking to be blessed? We would change the world, wouldn't we? So we're going to go through it one more time, the B-L-E-S-S, -S, and I'm going to hopefully give you some new things that you haven't heard before, but let's jump into it. So the first thing, the B, is begin with prayer. 
I bet you almost every one of you knows this verse out of 1 Thessalonians or 1 Timothy chapter 2, where Paul says, I exhort you first of all through supplication, prayers, and giving of thanks for all men, that kings in authority, that all men would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He says, now I exhort you first of all. Take a wild stab at it. What do you think first of all means? What do you think first of all means? Anybody know? <laughs> it means first of all. Aren't you glad you come to church and you learn stuff like this? You know, I study and learn and I read it in the Greek. And first of all means, first of all, you start with prayer. It's the very, 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 very first thing you do. I want you to think about Jesus for a minute. You know, we all think about Jesus and he got water baptized and he began his ministry. He hadn't done anything before the water baptism. He hadn't done a miracle, hadn't done a healing, hadn't preached the gospel. And we always think he got water baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon him, and then he went out and prayed. Or, or actually went out and preached. But that's not what happened. What was, where did he go? What was the first thing he did? He went into the wilderness for how long? 40 days and 40 nights where he prayed and fasted for that period of time. And then there's this little verse in the book of Mark. And it says, after the 40 days, he returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. You see, it all changed. The water baptism was significant, but it was that journey through the wilderness of praying first, beginning with prayer. And when we look at Jesus, Jesus had a bit of a pattern. I wonder if you've noticed that. He went from place of prayer to place of prayer, and he did miracles in between. Is that right? Isn't that what he did? You know, we're not, we're not so good at beginning with prayer. You know what we're good at? Ending with prayer, <laughs> right? When we're really desperate, we cry out in prayer. My, I, had, I had a transmission problem one time, and I sent it to the shop, and I got the phone call. You know when you have transmission problem, be worried, right? Be afraid, be very afraid. And so anyway, the guy called me up, and he said, Mark, are, are, you, are you sitting down? I said, I'm already on my knees, <laughs> right? You, you need to begin with prayer. And why is it that we end with prayer? How many of you have been in a meeting, you guys went on and on and on, talked about a million things, and at the end of the meeting, someone said, someone want to close in prayer? How many of you have been in that meeting? We've all been in that meeting. I was in one this week, and we, we had these, all these ideas, we're going out, et cetera, et cetera, and then someone said to me, Mark, would you close in prayer? And I'll tell you what I wanted to pray. I'll tell you what I was tempted to pray. I didn't pray it, but I wanted to pray, dear Lord. You have heard our collective ignorance. You have heard our carnal and dumb ideas that we have found that have been rooted deeply in finite human wisdom that have no hope of succeeding. But Lord, somehow by the miraculous grace of God, take them and turn them into something divine. That's what I wanted to pray. That's what I was thinking about. But I said something nicer than that because I'm a super nice guy. I already told you that. And so here's the thing. We look at, we look at Jesus and he begins with prayer. And all we have to do, you have people in your life that you would love to come and see Christ. You'd want them to come into a personal relationship with Jesus. You know that. And I got news for you. You don't lead them to Christ. They don't come to Christ on their own. There's only one way people come to Christ. And you know how it is? The Holy Spirit leads them. He says, no man comes to the Father except the Holy Spirit leads them. So that means prayer is the most powerful single thing we can do. Are you following me on this? So I want to tell you a little story about this. You'll like it. So a few years ago, uh, me and some of the gang, we were in, in Edmonton, we were doing a big event, we had, a large crowd came up, and at the end of the night, uh, I'd taken an altar call, a bunch of people came to Christ, and I was in the foyer, and people were coming up to say hello and shake my hand, and these, these two little old ladies came, they were exactly the same height, they both had white hair, and they came up to me, and the one, I can't, don't remember their names, but the one says, I'm so-and-so, and this is my mother so-and-so, and she's 97 years old. And I looked at her in a very smart aleck way. I said, I would have thought you were sisters. And she cooed and went, oh. And, and of course, you know, I meant you both look 100, was what I, what I meant. <laughs> but she didn't know that. And, and so anyway, I said, oh, that's so nice. And then this is what she told me. Here's the important part of the story. She says, my mother turned 97 years old a couple of weeks ago. And tonight, for the very first time in her life, she gave her heart to Jesus at 97 years old. And then she said to me, the daughter said to me, I had been praying for her for 35 years. And then, the, and then I turned to the mother and I said, isn't that wonderful? And this is what she told me. She said, you know, I always wondered why I had lived so long. And tonight, I know why. 
And I thought, that's the power of prayer, people. God kept her alive to 97 years old so that she could hear and respond to the message. He is never done. And God can miraculously keep someone to, alive to 150 if he wanted to because God answers our prayers. I get a lot of mail from people, emails and letters. And this particular day, I got a handwritten letter. And it was from this uh, lady in uh, Darlingford, Manitoba. And she wrote me this letter. And she said, dear Pastor Mark, I need your advice. I'm having a lot of trouble with my sons. My sons are running around. And they're going out drinking. And they're going out gambling. And they, they sleep in on Sunday morning. They won't go to church. And, and uh, you know they're not serving the Lord. Sometimes they skip work. What can I do? And then she says, P.S., I'm 88 years old, and my sons are in their 60s. <laughs> and I, when I got to the P.S., I had to crack up. I thought, oh, those little rascals. <laughs> those little rascally boys of yours running around. And so, of course, I didn't say those little rascals. I wrote her back and said, keep praying, because God's not done with them yet. So the first thing you do is you begin with prayer. The second thing is you listen with care. You know, it's fascinating about Jesus. We think that Jesus just ran around preaching and talking all the time. You know, like I do. And, and we just think, well, he just went and he preached to this group and preached to this group and preached to this group. We never really think of him as actually being a listener. But if you read the Gospels carefully, you discover that when he had one-on-one -on -one encounters with people, what did he do? He actually listened to them. When the rich young ruler came, he listened to him. And, and then when Nicodemus came at night, he listened to him. And when he met the woman at the well at Samaria, he listened to this woman. And you know why that was important? Because what he did was he custom tailored the message to each one of those people. To the rich young ruler, he said, sell all you have, give it all to the poor, and come and follow me. To Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. To the woman at the well, he said, if you would drink of this living water, you would thirst no more. Do you notice how he didn't go and say to everyone, you need to be born again, you need to be born again, you need to be born again. He only said that to one singular person, and that was Nicodemus. Because he needed to hear those particular words. And everybody else needed to hear something unique to them. The message of the gospel has to be custom tailored to where people are at. And you won't know that if you don't listen to them. We're not all good listeners. You know who's a terrible listener? Me. You know what I'm good at? Talking. And you probably know that. But I'm telling you, we have to learn to be le better listeners. I think we have, I think there's several ways of listening. I think there's not listening, some of us do that. There's listening, which is barely listening, and then there is active listening. And today I'm gonna to give you a little lesson on active listening. I didn't come up with this. It comes from the Center of Creative Leadership. It's a very, they do very good work. And here's how you really listen. If you really are listening, here's how you do it. I'm gonna throw it up on the screen. Number one, this is a biggie. You pay attention. <laughs> and you know, this is such, seems so simple, and yet it's so elusive for so, so many people. You know what you do to listen? You have to make eye contact with people. You have to not interrupt them. You have to have receptive body posture. Do you know if, if, you're, if you're standing there like this, you're not actually listening. Do I look like I'm listening? I'm not listening, you know what I'm doing? I'm talking at the moment, and I've got my hands crossed, and I don't have receptive body posture. The other thing that I would add to this is if you smile, it makes a big difference. You're paying attention, you're looking. I tell young people this all the time. If you could discover and establish these soft skills in your life of knowing how to listen and how to pay attention and how to make eye contact with people and how to smile, you will go a long way in this world. I'm telling you, soft skills are what really separate the losers from the winners. I'm sorry to tell you, but it's true. And every one of us can establish those soft skills. And you know, in our house, like Kathy kind of knows that I'm a bad listener. She doesn't really like that. She wants me to listen. I'm not sure why, but she does. And, and so here's what she does. If I'm watching television, she mutes it or turns it off. If I have my phone, she says, can you put that down? She knows that I can't do this and listen at the same time. Neither can you. So I put the phone down, I make eye contact with her, now she's got my attention, and maybe, just maybe, I'll listen. And so it, it goes on, we withhold judgment. We can't be saying all the way along, yeah, but, yeah, but, I know, but this, and but this, and but this. Just, just shut up for a minute, and listen. Number three, reflect. 
This is a Stephen Covey from Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He says you need to seek to understand before you seek to be understood. It's a very important, subtle difference. It makes a big difference. So you need to empathize with people. You need to try to understand their perspective before you give yours. But we don't do that. We want people to hear our opinion. We want them to hear our side of it. You seek to understand before you seek to be understood. Number four, clarify. If you don't understand something, ask for an example. Ask for an explanation. Then what you do is you summarize it back to them. You say, is this what you're trying to say? And, and don't be sarcastic or smart alecky about it. Just genuinely say, is this what you're trying to say? And if not, clarify it for me. And then the last and the final thing is then and only then have you earned the right to share your perspective. And I'm telling you something, if you don't know this, if you will actually listen to people, the door will swing wide open for you to share with them. Always. People feel heard and people feel respected. So I'm going to give you a fairly dramatic example about this. So this couple, they needed to come and see me. The, the woman was in the church. The husband was not. He wasn't a Christian. They were having problems. Big surprise. And uh, th they came to my office. They were sitting in my office. It was an evening. It was, it was you know, 7 o'clock at night or something like that. They sat down in my office. I had never met him before. And he just went off on her. Just went off. And he was just criticizing her. And then he started cursing. And then he started swearing. And he started dropping the F-bomb in my office. I had never heard that word before. Have you heard that word? It's awful. It's an awful word. And he's dropping these F-bombs on and on and on. And I'm sitting there thinking, what do I do about this? And he didn't just criticize his wife. He criticized everything. He criticized the church. He criticized the government. He criticized the prime minister. I agreed with some of what he said, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. I just felt like the Lord wanted me to just listen and let him get it all out. And I listened probably half an hour. And you know what? He ran out of steam. Eventually, you can only swear for so long, and then you're worn out. And so he finally was out of steam. And the whole time, I'm thinking, Lord, what, how do I respond to this? I mean, how do you respond to the F-bomb? And I felt like the Holy Spirit gave me one thing to say. And so I said it. I turned to him, and I said, do you really want to go through life this angry about everything? And he just started bawling. He just started bawling. He was crying his eyes out. He went from being virulently, virulently angry and vulgar to being viscerally sorrowful and full of grief. And I thought, huh, that was interesting. What did I do? Nothing. I just listened. He felt heard. And then when I did have the opportunity to speak, everything changed. And you see, that's what happens when we allow the Holy Spirit to work, and if we actually pay attention to people, it's amazing how they'll open up to us. It reminds me of this story of this husband and wife, they went to marriage counseling, and so they sat down, and the wife immediately started complaining about her husband, and she had lots of complaints, and she just went upside one side and down the other, and went on and on and on. Finally, the counselor got up from his seat, she was still talking, he went over there and grabbed her by the side of the face like this, and planted a big, fat, wet kiss right on her lips. And she just sat there in stunned silence. He turned to the husband and says, she just needs one of those a couple of times a week. All your problems are solved. To which he said, great, I can bring her by Tuesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> so the B is begin with prayer. The L is listen with care. The eat is to eat together. I'm wondering if you ever noticed Jesus' critics. They called him a friend of sinners. Anybody you know why they called him a friend of sinners? Yes, and he was a friend of sinners. See, aren't you glad you come to church? I keep teaching these things, interpreting the Bible for you. They called him a friend of sinners because he was a friend of sinners. And the reason, a few of you said it, the reason that he was a friend of sinners because he actually ate with them. He ate with the prostitutes and he ate with the Pharisees and he ate with the tax collectors. Why did he do that? Because when you eat together with someone, you defuse and you de-escalate situation. See, I don't know why we think that we can share the gospel with people we don't love and we, and we pretend we know them, but we don't really know them and we don't really love them enough to have a meal with them. See, when you break bread with someone, it doesn't matter how good or bad a person they are, when you break bread with someone, what you do is you break down those barriers between you. And people, it's really hard to be mad at someone who's serving you food. Have you noticed that? And there is something about that. And Jesus understood that. 
And so you see him in these various dining situations. So I'm going to just tell you one quick story about this, where we saw this happen with ourselves. So last week, I told you this cool story about how we went to this Christmas party and saw this great kitchen, and they were tearing it out, and we bought it from them. Remember that story last week? So that's the one side of that story. We took it, and we installed it in our house. And this couple that invited us to that party, they weren't really our friends. Our kids were friends. Our daughter was a friend of their daughter. And uh, that's why we got invited to this Christmas party. So Kathy and I decided, you know, this is a great couple. We should get to know these people. And, you know, uh, they could, we could probably be good friends with these people. It'd be cool to be friends. So on several occasions, we invited them to things. And we reached out to them. And it was kind of, you know, always they, always, they probably genuinely had something on. But see, for you, you probably think to yourself, Hanging out with Mark and Kathy would be like the most awesome experience in the world. That's probably what you're thinking. You know what most people out there think? That's the last guy I want to hang out with. <laughs> they, they think I'm a judgment meter, and they're going to sit there, and, and all of their sins will be revealed. And people don't want to hang out with the pastor, for goodness sakes. So we, we have a lot more trouble than you think. So anyway, we were inviting them to stuff, and, they, and we just couldn't get an affirmative answer on it. And so then we had this idea. It was right under our nose. It's always right under your nose. We said, why don't we invite them to supper to see their kitchen in our house? Who wouldn't go to that invitation? Kathy phoned her up and asked the wife. Immediately she said, yes, we're available. Yes, we'll be there. And they came and they were so excited to see their kitchen in our home. But more importantly for us, we got to sit down and break bread together with them and actually connect with them on a personal and a social level. And they talked about their faith and we talked about our faith. And it was wonderful. I thought, this is how God works. And more often than not, the opportunities, right under your nose. So the B stands for begin with prayer. The L stands for listen with care. The E stands for eat together. The S stands for serve in love. I bet a bunch of you could quote Acts 10.38. It says how Jesus of Nazareth went about doing good in healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Jesus went about doing good. You know, one of my interesting things that I discover when I talk to people is I say, so how are you doing? And they'll say, I'm doing good. I say, no, you're doing well. What? No, Jesus was doing good. You're doing well. What do you mean? No, you're not doing good. Jesus was doing good. He went about, when it says he was doing good, it means he was literally doing good. He was doing good things. So when I ask people, how are they are, and they say, oh, I'm doing good. I say, really? Prove it. <laughs> you know, Jesus was doing well, too, but he was also doing good. And so don't tell me you're doing good if you're just doing well. Doing well is when you're blessed. Doing good is when you're blessing others. Huh? Huh? It, it, it's good to be blessed. It's better to be a blessed scene. And Jesus went about blessing others. He was doing good. And there's a little formula in this. You've probably heard it from me before, but if not, here it goes. Good works produce goodwill that gives you the opportunity to share the good news. Did you catch that? See, good works, it's very interesting. When you start doing good things for people, when you start treating them well, blessing them, serving other people in love, it produces goodwill. Again, it's hard to be mad at you. It's hard to be mad at someone who's serving somebody in love. You all agree with that, don't you? So good works produces goodwill, and that goodwill is what gives you the opportunity to share the good news. So here's my illustration about this. I got lots and lots of illustrations, personal and otherwise, on this. So last year, uh, Kathy and I were over visiting some friends. These were actually real friends, people that actually like us. And so <laughs> we, were, we were over visiting these friends. And, and uh, their, their place, something had happened, and the, it kind of rotted out under the, under the garden door. And they had to have this contractor come in and put a new beam underneath the garden door and reinforce this, and it was, the house had sunk, and it was crooked, and so they straightened this up, and now what happened is the garden door wouldn't close, because it had got happy with being crooked, right? And it had been crooked all these years, and now the house is straight, and the door was crooked. And so he's telling me, he says, the contractor says I need a new door, and it's gonna be $1,500 plus installation. I said, you don't need a new door, you just need to straighten that door. He said, can the door be straightened? I said, yeah, it was straight before. It can be back straightened. It just needs to be pulled out, straightened, put it back in. So then anyway, I gave him that great advice. <laughs> Didn't offer to do anything about it. So we're on our way home, and Kathy said, why didn't you offer to straighten that door for him? Huh? You know how to straighten that door, don't you? I said, of course I know how to straighten that door. She says, why didn't you offer to straighten the door for him? 
because I didn't want to. <laughs> I, didn't, I don't want to do that. She says, why wouldn't you do that? It's going to save him like $2,000. Why wouldn't you do that for him? I said, you know what, Kathy? I should do that for him. You know, I'm not nearly as good a Christian as I pretend to be. <laughs> so anyway, the next day, phoned him up. I said, we're going to come over and straighten your door. He said, really? I said, yeah, we can straighten that door. So Kathy and I went over the next day, and I brought my tools with me, and Kathy and the, the wife, they hung out. You know that in 45 minutes, I took that door out, straightened it, reinstalled it perfectly straight. He couldn't believe it. He said, you did this for me? You came over and did this for me? I said, well, you know me. It's just kind of a guy I am. <laughs> I'm not going to give Kathy the credit for that, for goodness sake. Here's the end of the story. Two weeks later, almost to the day, he and his wife were sitting right there in church two weeks later. See, this is what happens when you serve in love. So you begin with prayer, you listen with care, you eat together, you serve in love, and then the last and the final piece of this is you share your story. Do you see how you wait, have to wait to the end of this to share your story? Are you, are you getting this? And you will get your opportunity. And here's what I found out more often than not, is if, if you will actually do these other things, pray for people and care about them and break bread with them and, and serve them, you don't actually ever have to force your story on them. You know what happens? This is what I've discovered, is that people ask me, and they say, tell me how you became a Christian, or tell me how you went into the ministry. You know what that is? It's a door swinging open for you to tell your story. And you don't have to kick any doors down. The door will open, and don't miss this. When the door opens, please go through it. Take the opportunity. Sometimes people miss those opportunities. Now, here's what I want to tell you to do. Last thing. When it comes to telling your story, Start with a two to three minute version of it, right? You didn't want to go to all that work, and then when it comes for you to tell your story, you go, well, I was born on a Tuesday in 1958. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that story. Your own wife doesn't want to hear that story. And no, your mother doesn't want to hear that story. No one wants to hear that story. They want to know the goods. They want to know what happened to you. What happened? What got on to, into you that changed you and made you into the person you are? And that story, that version, you need to practice this. Find someone to practice telling your story with. That story should be two to three minutes long. And you know what will happen? That two to three minute version of your story will turn into a half an hour discussion. But don't start with the half an hour. Are you following this? And so what did God say to Abraham? He said, get out and I will bless you. And I will be a blessing in you and through you and you will be a blessing to others. You see, I think we have this great opportunity to reach our world. Our community is lost and dying without hope in this world, without Christ. And they need to hear the message of the gospel. We don't need to go hit them over the head with a Bible and tell them they're going to hell. What we need to do is just do this simple five-step program that we begin with prayer and we would begin to take that journey, take the slow road road and just allow the Holy Spirit to do the work and in the end you're going to see more people come to Christ than you ever thought was possible. It's good to be blessed but it's better to be a blessing. Let's stand together, shall we? All right, I want to ask you all to close your eyes. I need a couple minutes with you first. First, I, I, I need, for those of you that are here, with every head bowed, every eye closed, we do this every service, there's probably people here, and you haven't made this decision to accept Christ, but I'll tell you why you're here. There's someone in your life blessing you right now. Somebody praying for you, and someone listening to you, and someone eating together with you, and someone serving you. And today you heard a story, and now you're being tugged in your heart that maybe it's time for you to come to a relationship with Jesus. And we always make this really simple. We don't call anybody forward, ask them to say anything publicly, but right where they are, if you would like to make that decision so that you would know that you're on your way to heaven when you leave this world, I want you to just lift up your hand. Just let me see it. I'm not going to call you forward, not singling you out. Take a moment. Let me see that hand. Thank you. His hand's popping around the room. Once I've seen it, you can put it down. Wonderful. Terrific. Great. All right. You can all put down your hands. I didn't see everybody's hand, but Jesus did, and that's what matters. So let's pray together. You ready? Lord Jesus, I thank you for the work of the cross. That rather than being blessed, 
You blessed me. You gave to me with your life. You sacrificed and died for my sins. You rose again on the third day. And you forever live to be my Lord. That you would first bless me so that I could be a blessing. And Lord, help me in that journey. Help me to go out into my world and bless those who my life intersects and to give my best to love, to care, and to share. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Let's give Jesus a little shout, shall we?